quite often, especially in uh, advanced cases, the rigid ILM forms faults and prevents a re and a good recovery of the retina. So I use the same technique with macula packets, IPL, IPL by ILM as well. Very good. We will, we will come back to you, uh, Vincenzo, in a moment. Let's go to uh, Dr. Uh, Sherman in OR2 uh, in Germany. Uh, good morning. It's good morning. Peter. Nice to How hear you? from you. And morning. welcome to Lutzbach. Good. good. Can you, good. I'm here with, uh, with uh, Grazia and Klaus. Can you uh, describe uh, your uh, case for us? Yes. Uh, um, today we will have a case of uh, a macular hole, which is special in that case that the edges are adherent. So it's not really an atrophic macular hole, but uh, the edges are completely adherent. So standard techniques uh, are not useful because we have to approximate the edges. And this is the reason why we use the subretinal bleb formation technique, which we have recently described. And uh, um, today I will do this case uh, with uh, Dina, who will assist me. Okay, we start. Um, so first of all, just to show you some uh, new issues. Um, finally, the Avita trocars are in the market, which are completely refined because we have this push-fit connection, which um, finally avoids 100% um, sure um, a disconnection, an inadvertent disconnection, and it allows for a higher pressure for silicon oil installation. And uh, we still have the known and well-approved um, MVR blade design, which is sure nearly 100% water tightness. You see that we use a slightly different technique, which we have published. So it's a limbus parallel approach and not a radial approach, but this is just a minor detail. We have done the FACO before we're um, on broadcast. So the FACO is ready, and if you look, if you look on, the, on the lens, on the intraocular lens, then you see that we have a, a 6.8 millimeter a diameter, which is larger than a standard cataract intraocular lens, and we use this special lens in cases of combined vitrectomy and cataract surgery, especially in cases of uh, air or gas tamponade. So we have a much more stable... Interesting. Do you change your IOL, Klaus, when you are doing... Uh We changed the IOL when? Ten years I use what we, what we call the Tassignon lens uh, or the, the bill back in the lens. We use it always because we um, like the stabilization. It cannot move when you have an uh, intraocular tamponade either by, by silicon oil or by gas or so. Very good, Peter. We will come back to you in just a moment, but let's rejoin OR3, Dr. Ferrara. Uh, Vincenzo, we're back with you. Tell us where you are. Very delicate way, 
just where you want. So, which is a very less consuming of say. This is a dual blue without blue game. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, which is also the photo, you don't change, uh, it, it's very ergonomic because you don't change, you don't have to, to change to, uh, to a, a tire engine. I learned this technique uh, recently. Yeah, I, yeah. I learned the recently this technique from uh, David Steele, and I have to say it is indeed uh, really safe. You aspirate into the cutter, you don't run the risk that there is a sticky yeah, syringe and inject all of a sudden, and maybe it happens to inject uh, even under the, the retina. And, and so it is, uh, it is really soft and you can pour it uh, where you want to have it. What is the uh, volume that you can aspirate and how much can you draw up and uh, push back? Yeah, quite a lot because you, you aspirate as you were aspirating anything and it remains in the tubing. And then you use the uh, backflush of the system, uh, consistent reflux. It, it has a name in the machine, but I can't remember. And, and so you, as long as you push the bottom, you have a reflux uh, of what you have in the tubing. And so you, you can inject how much you want. Very good, we see your engagement. We will go now to, we'll, we'll, we will come back shortly. Let's go to, we have to go to OR2, uh, Dr. Sherman. Can we go to OR2? And we'll, we'll join in a moment. But let's see Dr. Uh, Sherman for one second, if we can. So Peter, we're back with you. We see you are peeling away. Yes, so we don't have a real traction. So this peeling is just a standard peeling of the ILM. There is no epiretinal membrane at all. And you see that we have a certain atrophic it, 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 aspect. And I hope you, you see the preoperative OCT. It, 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 so with this uh, adherent edges. And we now have to approximate the edges. So go pick there. So the peeling is done. Peter, the preoperative OCT. We saw the preoperative OCT with the, yes. with the barrel-like configuration of the hole with strong adherence. Yes, good to show it again. Uh, there, there obviously, Peter, there is no traction. Is it really necessary to remove the ILM in these cases or in this situation? I totally agree, and I like to, to pose these controversial <laughs> discussions in uh, such an exclusive panel like we have. So, in fact, I was thinking if it's necessary, but I don't believe that a simple ILM peeling is uh, so, such a trauma, and I want, of course, to uh, avoid any tangential traction. Basically, tangential or a persistent tangential traction is the reason for persistent macular holes. But in this special case, so um, Peter, I don't think that it's 100% necessary. Peter, I'm going to ask you a special thing. If you would, uh, if you would pause before you do the subretinal blebs, because I have to go to another room and then we will return to see you form the blebs, okay? Yeah. If you will pause before you do it. I want to make sure the audience gets to see. So we'll be back in a moment. We would like to go to doc, uh, Dr. Barak in Israel. Uh, if we could go to uh, OR4, please, camera four. Uh, and Dr. Barak, hello. Dr. Schwartz. Um, 
Hello, we, we hear you very well. Thank you, Professor. And and Dr. Barak, we will come right back to your case, but Dr. Uh, Sherman, can we go to room two to see the bleb formation, uh, Peter? Uh, we are rejoining you. We see you've put some PFO in the eye. Yeah, perfect. So now we do the decisive step. Uh, we use three or four subretinal BSS uh, um, blebs to approximate the edges. Okay, it's like some spur. Go. How is the injection done? Um, manually? Yeah, or? Very good question. It's still yeah. done manually. And question. we are waiting on the innovation uh, for the EVA Nexus because um, uh, in 2022, we will have integrated in the machine um, the micro injection system, which allows a foot pedal controlled micro injection of a small volumes, which is necessary, for example, for a subretinal RTPEA injection or for blood formation to prepare a Pixio microchip implantation or gene therapy or RPE um, transplantation. And um, it works quite well with a trained nurse like Dina with a manual injection, so the nurse injects it. Um, but it doesn't work in all cases, and I will fe feel much safer when I have a foot pedal controlled um, micro injection. Go. Uh, Peter, you should not have mentioned her name because now everyone will offer her a job. With, yes, uh, I know, pay. but no chance. So, uh, <laughs> be yes, careful. No, but no chance. <laughs> Go. You can use uh, the um, silicon oil, heavy fluid uh, pump to inject even for a small volume, Ab the regular one. Absolutely, but it is, and it works. Um, we've used it, but it's not comparable to the uh, system which will be inaugurated, which is really... Um, designed for microvolume injection, and I need a 100% controlled injection with about uh, um, 5 microliters or 10 microliters per second. And this is not exact enough with the current but silicon oil pump, but the microinjection tool of DORC Peter, will be based on the silicon oil pump, but with improved software. So, yes, uh, Peter, with your kindness, if I could ask you to pause once more in your surgery, because we want to come back as you join the blebs. But we'll go now to Dr. Ferrara in room three. Vincenzo, we have returned. We saw you were doing an elegant peel. Uh, where are you now in your case? Dr. Ferrara, can we have room three? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? We hear, yes, perfect. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, they are right hands of the 
help of the ICPIC that the, the Polovia final is completely isolated and the Polovia contour is, uh, is good, if you see here. So I, I did it because I was trying feeding and uh, there was some, some risk of creating a hole there. Very, very good. We will come back and uh, let's go back to Peter Sherman in room two. If we could have an exchange to room two, uh, please. Yeah, so the room two. So, I, so Peter. Yeah, the decisive steps have already so been what are done. You? And uh, we just do a fluid air exchange and fill it with gas. That's it, basically. The fluid itself. So tell. tell Yes. Peter, I have a question. Why did you put that small PFO, PFCL bubble in at the beginning? What did, what did you do with that? What yes. role does that play? A very good question. Basically, we don't want that the blebs join in the fovea until the last bleb is formed. Once the fluid is broken through the fovea, because the edges are dissolved, then you cannot continue with uh, bleb formation. The, the surgery is over, basically, and you must be satisfied with, for example, one bleb. Um, so first I do the bleb formation. I, I must ask you... I must ask you if you discovered that the first time or if that was something that you discovered after you had some difficulty, because I would not have thought of that step. So I, I'm very impressed. Yeah, so basically the, the technique is based on a, on a working group with uh, Karsten Meyer, Boris Stanzel, the Munich group, and we've uh, published a large multi-center study, and we all use the same technique. But the second part of the question is also right. I had the experience, unfortunately, that subretinal injection can lead to opening of the, of the macular hole, and then the bleb formation is not possible anymore. So you see, it's not completely joined. How do you? Not completely joined. But uh, it will. It will, um, 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 the bleb formation will continue under the air pressure. So the patient will not lie in a prone position, but it in a flat lying position to continue the bleb formation and the opening of the edges. It's a beautiful surgery, Peter. When you are finished, please join us for an interview. And now we can go to Gosh. Dr. Barak in OR4, who is completing the vitrectomy. So, uh, if, so Adiel, we're back with you, and you are doing your peripheral vitrectomy, we see. Water. Yeah. It's very important in rectal detachment surgeries where, where we can actually view the, the periphery much better and in a higher magnification than maybe we, what we usually do. And later on, when we will go to the macula itself, we will be able to see this picture again. And if maybe you can describe a little bit better the bionic uh, system, the properties, how you do you use it, if you still need a uh, biome to. So there, there is a biome that is connected to the system itself. The, the head piece, is, is, as you can see, uh, you can already see, is over the head. And actually, only with the head gestures, uh, we are using uh, all the features that we used to do with our microscopic. Can, uh, can, can we cut to can we cut to the OR view of the can, uh, can, uh, can we cut to the OR view and see Dr. Barak in his headgear? If we could show that again, uh, your camera that shows the OR. If you can change to uh, 
the surgeon. Okay, great. Here we are. Neil, we will return. We will return <laughs> shortly. But we will now introduce uh, Claudio Panico in operating room one. And if we can uh, have the diap. Good morning, Claudio. We're with you uh, Hello, in your body. case. And we're going to show the diapositive of your of the slide of your case. So, Gloria, can you present? Thank you. The On an existing um, microscope, uh, traditional microscope, uh, but uh, um, introducing it into a, a new digital microscope. Um, Sorry, but I lose the infusion. Very good. We will come back. Let's let's return to Israel to Dr. Barak in OR4. Yeah. Was that uh, what stain was that, Adio? What stain did you use? Because you had a very uh, very nice stain on that. Was that dual or brilliant blue? The dual blue. Dog. Dual the blue. Dual blue. So Peter, we'll shift now. Uh, we'll come back shortly. Uh, we'll go back to uh, Peter Sherman in room two. Uh, so Peter, you just performed an amazing case demonstrating a beautiful technique for difficult macular holds. Uh, do you have any comments? How did that case go according to your uh, opinion? Yeah, basically, you have seen it's a quick and easy surgery. It is more important is the decision when to do uh, just an ILM flap or epimacular uh, amniotic patch like this next case here or the subretinal blap injection. And the question is always, is it sufficient to reattach the edges of the macular hole, or is it, has it um, attached edges, and we need an approximation of the edges? And um, all the techniques well, are while you are While you are here, sorry about the satellite delay, while you are here, can you describe in the same moment, the next case that you are about to perform, we saw briefly your slide. Can you restore your slide and tell us about this case? Yeah. And then we can keep talking. Yes. So it's a wonderful case, to, to my opinion, because it shows the problems of inverted ILM flap. Of course, during the Congress, I show, like all other colleagues, the successful cases where you have a beautiful overlying inverted flap. But this is also a real life situation. A normal inverted flap uh, several weeks ago and a reopening um, after the gas bubble is gone. And in this case, we don't have any more peeling. So of course we will remove the ILM flap, but we have no real peeling to relieve the traction. And here we have, uh, we need some bridge to, to, to overcome the macular hole. And the new technique, still current, uh, uh, quite new technique, is the epimacular amniotic patch. Stan Rizzo has uh, sufficiently described the subretinal patch, um, but we use exclusively the epiretinal patch as uh, a replacement of the ILM flap, for example, which is not possible in persistent macular holes. Uh, let's go to Dr. Uh, Ferrara uh, for an interview after your case. So, Vincenzo, tell us about your case. How did it go compared to your plans? And 
so with the AD, to some degree, the AD is better. But uh, the fact that you can manipulate the changes in the chart, the, 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 the visualization, by working on the, on the long chart and the visualization on the last. So you have the best visualization of the green area. And so it was possible to see in the new tiny gray. And it was possible to see the, in the thicker gray, because we're working in the, in the prevalence. And you, well, you, you did a, you did a terrific, you, Vincenzo, you did a terrific job, uh, not only uh, getting the peel done, but also in identifying those incidental breaks and treating them. Uh, a lot to do in a live surgery uh, case. We, we really appreciate uh, the excellence of your surgery. And forgive us, we have five rooms going now, and uh, we must leave you. But thank you again for sharing your uh, surgery in Floretina. Let's go to OR1, Dr. Panico, if we can uh, have a look at Dr. Panico's surgery. So, uh, I, uh, Claudio, uh, we're back with you. Tell us where yes. you are. Um, I performed the core vitrectomy, and then I put a triancinol on to, to highlight the posterior yiloid. And uh, I removed the posterior yaloid from, from the, this nerve to the temporal size and in centripetal way to trim the, the yaloid, the posterior yaloid. And then I introduced a double blue dye to remove the ILM. You, you did not, Claudio, you did not stain the vitreous with triumphin alone, or? Yes, did I before, miss yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, and do you try? We are, we are not in, on the air mm. when I put it in, in the eye. Tell me, Gracia. Uh, do you try to lift, if you find cortical vitreous, do you try to lift it up uh, to the periphery? or only at outside the vascular arcade? I, I perform a, a core vitrectomy and uh, I stop uh, to the arcade. Vascular arcade. Yes. Are you using yes. a contact lens? Yes. Are I you performing all the surgery with a contact lens? Yes. I, my plan is uh, yes. Uh, at the end, uh, we, we control uh, with an indentation, the peripheral retina with a recite. Uh, but the plan is to perform uh, all all the vitrectomy with uh, the contact lens. Uh, mm -hmm. You have more, more retinal details, more vitreous details. Uh, I using 10% uh, of uh, light uh, with uh, Artivo. You can uh, you can save more. Uh, Phototoxicity a lot with uh, this, uh, this microscope. Thank you, Claudio. We will go uh, now to uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Barak in OR4. Uh, Adiel, we're back with you in operating room. Uh, we see an air fluid exchange being performed. What? Why, why are you doing the air fluid exchange? Why, why an air fluid exchange in this case? If you can please, uh, after your case, if you can please remain live, we will come back for an interview and keep your wonderful headset on. Uh, we will let you take it off so everyone can see your face, but we want to do an interview with you. Let's, uh, let's go now to uh, OR2, uh, back to Peter. So Peter, I just saw you bubbling something into the eye. <laughs> yeah, I've bubbled something in the eye. Basically, I show you, uh, I've removed the ILM remnants, and in fact, there were 
more ILM remnants than it was visible in, intra, in the preoperative OCT. So this might be the reason, but still the, the persistent macular hole is quite large, and I don't think that a resurgery without any additional um, uh, patch will solve the situation, and therefore we will implant an epimacular amniotic patch. That's what we will do. Die Luft auf 10 runter. So you said epimacular amniotic patch. Exactly. Uh, so most amniotic patches, mo most amniotic patches that I have seen have been subretinal, whereas the autologous retinal grafts have been either subretinal mm. or superficial. So I think this is something new for me. Grazia, you're shaking your head. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it is pretty new for me too. Although I spoke a couple of years sure. ago with uh, Peter about this technique. Um, I think it is interesting, but it gives the possibility to choose to go for a larger membrane, a larger diameter, and uh, if you put it on top, you don't need to manipulate the subretinal space. In addition, the um, amniotic membrane is pretty rigid, and so it does not fit properly in the more macular hole unless you punch it of the real right size of the hole. Uh, which, which punch, which measure size is it, uh, Peter? It's uh, six millimeters, so it's a quite large yeah. patch so which uh, overlies large. the macula, the total macula. Yeah. Flow. And we will stain it. Basically, it's a similar technique like the DMEC, so perfect translational uh, technique uh, from other disciplines. Uh, here we don't stain the decimate membrane, but the, the epiretinal amniotic patch. Just to visualize it. And uh, yeah, in two minutes we will implant it. So you see, it's quite large. Yeah, yeah, six I agree millimeters. with you. I use the same staining because otherwise you lose control of the membrane. While so inside, you can perfectly visualize where it is if it moves uh, and what you do. I'm also curious about your technique to introduce it. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, indeed, this is the important step. Um, and the, the, yeah, the small trick is that we use 23-gauge throw cars, but we inserted it with 27-gauge forceps. Yeah, correct. Was da drauf? Hier. Yeah. Licht. And the new Avita throw cars, which are funnel-shaped, they help to introduce it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I use uh, the same technique. Smaller forceps and it goes in pretty easily. Yes, and there are several techniques to... And you are already under air. Yes. I've used both techniques. Um, once the mm. under under PFCL. Okay, so here is uh, mm -hmm. the patch, and we will close the um, the ventile. Zweiter. Und die ich krieg die Okay. Yes. Let's 
the other way around. Okay, now we have a, a stable posterior chamber again. Stop saga. Stop saga. Okay, so under PFCL, it's a little bit easier to introduce it, but it's more difficult to expand it. So there are advantages and disadvantages. Lust of Zehn. So you're still on air? So now you are going for a really dry, a really dry eye here at this point. Yeah, very good question because we are not going for a hundred pincetta, hundred percent dry eye. We need a small fluid layer to um, expand the, the patch. But it's, yeah, it's perfectly, uh, not perfectly, but it's well expanded. Interesting, you need just enough fluid to be able to skate it across the retinal surface, but yes. not so much that it folds and uh, becomes uncontrollable. Exactly, yeah. Skating is a nice word. Uh, that's it. And we use silicon oil, and uh, in all cases, Denzerone, so that means heavy silicon oil, which is more sticky and uh, avoids dislocation because under silicon oil 5000 it can dislocate a little bit by the way we have a little fold here so, it's I not possible to remove it or stop sorry but peter it looks as if the uh, original hole is round about for maximum 500 microns not so large or? Yes, but uh, don't forget it's a persistent macular hole and uh, we have just published the largest series with uh, nearly 80 eyes of persistent macular holes and uh, the, the um, um, uh, success rate is still good but not as good like in the primary hole. So the question of the, uh, the large holes, more than 500, is important and scientifically evaluated in uh, primary macular holes, but not for secondary ones. So, do, so Peter, I understand you will now put uh, complete the air fluid exchange and go to oil. Is that correct? Yes. Very good. So let's uh, let's we are going to introduce Caporossi's case in OR3, and then following that, we will go to Dr. Barak for an interview. So, uh, Tommaso, uh, good morning, Tommaso. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Rome. Good, good. So, uh, let's have Gloria, are you describing Dr. Rossi's yes. case? Yes, we'll have the slide of uh, Tommaso's case. The patient is a young lady with a visual acuity of count and finger. Uh, she had already undergone previous visual retinal surgery, and as you can see, they tried to treat the pit even with lasers. The recurrent retinal detachment that she has today, we speculate, has a mixed uh, pathogenesis, uh, both due to the pit and to that hole that there is there in the macula. The retina looks stiff and wrinkled, and there is still a residual bubble of gas in, uh, that you can see in the white field retinography. So we are all looking forward to see how Tommaso is going to handle this highly challenging case. So, Tommaso, what is your approach uh, with this patient? Optic disc pit, every case can be different. What is your approach for this one? Okay, so the, the first problem was the, 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 the previous intervention that she has. That she has. And the, as you see, the, the retina is a little wrinkled. So uh, she, she had a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of kinetia. And uh, the midriasis was was impossible to the fifth lamp, so I have to put this uh, iris hook 
to have them, and then uh, there is a, a little amount of laser here. And all well, this is an amazing this is an amazing innovation, and several of us have had a chance to put the headpiece on. It is very ergonomic, very intuitive. Which path Claudio is going to take? So very very elegant case, Claudio. Tell us your approach. Uh, it doesn't have any membranes. We had an LCT for a few months ago. It doesn't have any membranes. Um, there's a little bit of fluid uh, in the surgery. And um, so um, let's start. Very good. We will return. Uh, and now if we can go to OR4 uh, to Dr. Peter Sherman. Uh, yes, Peter, we have joined you. If you can describe your patient for us. St. Louis. Yes. So it's a 62-year-old. Peter. Um, okay. So it's a 60-year-old. Continue, old, Peter. It's a 60-year-old patient with uh, repetitive PVR He has been operated externally in a private practice setting for retinal detachment and had redetachment for PVR silicon oil surgery and after silicon oil release we have found licht aus we have found this situation so we have a good peripheral laser circlage but we have a, a small PVR layer on the retina and this practice macular hole um, so this this is the situation and the strategy will be um, first to stain and look for PVR membranes um, and then to close the break again with an epimacular amniotic patch. So you see this helps in several situations, not only for standard macular holes. So, so Luft. First. What do you think is the cause of the such a strange break? Yeah, so it's PVR. I'm sure it's PVR, and I don't see it currently. That's why we will stain it. But either it's an intraoperative trauma, but I have no information about this. And, um, or it is a tractional cause, and that's what I think. This is also a highly myopic patient, and maybe this may also explain due to the thin retina. So it's quite large macular hole. It's like a trauma situation. I've rarely seen such a situation. That's why we have uh, selected the case for today. We are all thinking that it's probably related to some kind of trauma, trauma or surgical misadventure, something that happened during the first surgery that... Uh, yes, but if we don't close it, the visual acuity will be don't. gone. So we need to bridge it, at least to, to, to help bridging with something. And this is my hope that we will either find um, PVR membranes and we can relieve the traction or the amniotic membrane helps to bridge this defect. So PFCL. And I try to to protect the subretinal space that the staining ink will not enter the subretinal space. I'm not sure if this is successful, but I try to protect it with the uh, PFCL bubble. No? No?
Normally, I don't like to drain fluid through a macular hole if we have a macular hole assistant retinal detachment. But this defect is so large that it doesn't make sense to, to apply a retinotomy and look, it goes under the retina. I think it's not avoidable, but maybe you, we can discuss how to avoid that the, the staining fluid enters the subretinal space. Grazia, do you have an idea? No, in fact, uh, <clears throat> I don't have a technique, a safe technique. To put a bubble, PF4 can help in reducing it. The other idea is to try to aspirate the fluid as much as you can uh, and reattach the retina before you put, uh, you stain it. Um, another choice is to uh, keep the intraocular pressure pretty low when you inject it and maybe to uh, stain directly between uh, the retinal surface and the, and the PFO bubble to avoid penetration, but you cannot prevent completely the, the passage and, uh, of, of blue under the retina. Peter, what, what, what kind of instrumentation do you use? What kind of? 27 or no, it's instrumentation? 20. What gauge? It's 23. In difficult cases, yeah, our standard what, is 23. If you use for, for suction, what if you use for the suction of the subretinal fluid a 27, a 27 gauge cannula? Uh, this is uh, a normal fluid cannula. So, passive suction. You know, I have never done a direct, I've never done a direct comparison, but my impression is that viscoelastic is better for excluding than using PFCL because the PFCL can roll around and get it, whereas the viscoelastic will stay there. But I have not done, have you done that comparison? Uh, I always fear that, that the viscoelastic goes through the hole in the subretinal space and then, of course, it's a disaster in my, my opinion. Why is it a disaster? Because it stays there for some days. But he's going to patch over it anyway. Well, I have no experience with patch. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. Yeah. So you're taking us into unknown territory, uh, Peter. We are going into the unknown here with this case. Yeah, I think the discussion is very Dr. fruitful uh, and has shown that there is no standard technique to prevent uh, the subretinal staining. I don't think that it matters in those cases here with the limited visual prognosis. But I also share the, the idea that neither viscoelastic nor PFCL uh, are very helpful. Right. Very good. We'll come back. Let's, uh, Dr. Barak, we're with you. Uh, tell us where you are in the case. Uh, so, Tommaso, uh, they selected a very easy case for you, right? Yeah, I, I, I know. It, we tried to have one. Uh, we tried to have one with all of that and also a tumor in the eye, but it was difficult to find <laughs> such a patient. <laughs> but tell us uh, how you thought through the case and how it went according to your plans. That was the plan, the plan for the case. Yeah, I, I, I was, I, um, I, I. It's better for the functional results, the ILM or the amniotic membrane patch? For the functional results, uh, uh, are the same, I even, I even, because then, it's not like the, the macular hole, no? In right. the macular hole, uh, has been has been shown that the ILM stuck inside the macular hole, even more the ILM harvest from the periphery of the arcades, uh, can induce some uh, uh, alteration in the structure of the of the retinal layer. Uh, the amniotic membrane seems to uh, regenerate some layers of the of the retina, even more the the more external one. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in the in the optic pit, uh, the, the the mechanism is only to to, to cover to close. And so, uh, do you have any? No, in my experience, the amniotic membrane in optic pit sometimes moves. I yeah, move. yeah, I think so. It's not it's not uh, easy. So it's uh, it's no, but because you you end the case. Um, Bring Francesco if we could have OR three. 
morning, Don. Good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to Paris. Uh, we are now dealing with the recurrent retinal detachment. Uh, in the patient uh, who we first saw last week, uh, after having had the removal of silicone oil elsewhere uh, about one month ago. Is that is that when you decided? Is is that when you decided to change patients with Fabio Patelli? <laughs> is what we are is what we are seeing, Francesco? Is what we are seeing now is the residual capsule stuck to the iris? Is that what we are seeing in the? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I will try to enlarge, first of all, the uh, capsule. Very good. We will come right back, but I would like to go to OR4 for a moment. Uh, if we can go to uh, Peter Sherman. And uh, so, Peter, now you have... Uh, completed the ILM peel around the irregular macular hole, and you are reinforcing the previous, uh, well, endocerclage. Are yeah. you planning to laser the uh, macular hole? No. <laughs> no, of course not. You so. scared us there for a moment. You had the probe. With the yes, I wanted to show you the ILM area. So it's only a small area where ILM peeling was possible. Uh, hope I scared you not too much. Question for uh, Peter. Hmm? Yes, uh, go ahead, please. Yes. Peter, there's a... So basically, I don't see a lot of PVR, even in the periphery. I don't see peripheral breaks. It seems to be exclusively caused by the central break, so a highly myopic retinal detachment due to a large... Yatro, possibly iatrogenic macular hole. And uh, so the laser is not really necessary. I just add some uh, very slight um, uh, laser burns, and that's it. And the only idea I have to add a possible healing uh, incentive is the epiretinal macular epimacular amniotic membrane. We can discuss it in the, in the panel. Peter, if you would you, choose Peter, another technique, yes, do Peter, you think a subretinal amniotic membrane oh, is superior? Peter, hold on, hold that thought one second. We have a question from the audience for you. So if we can, uh, if the audience questioner can again state their uh, question, we'll listen. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Yes, my name is Luis Amselem from Barcelona. I think the mouth shape of the tear in the macular area is because a shortening in the retina because of the peripheral shortening of the retina over so much laser in the periphery, temporal periphery, and that's why the retina has shortened it and broke. Possibly also an ILM dissection during first surgery has a, 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 thinned the retina, but the problem is in the periphery. I think mm. to solve this case, you have to redetach the retina, first with a soft tip cannula, redetach the retina under fluid, and then be, uh, put the retina back with perfluorocarbon, join the retina here, and then uh, re uh, redo your posterior uh, pexia with laser. The problem will not be solved uh, this way. Well, sorry. thank you. Thank That's you for your... Think. Thank you for your comment. Uh, I think the three moderators would probably disagree uh, somewhat with that statement because you would have, number one, great difficulty detaching the retina over all that laser, and number two, if you were successful, you would have postage stamp breaks. What is your thought, uh, Klaus? Yeah, exactly. You have an enlarged additional trauma. You have to make a retinotomy and, and all this stuff. Theoretically, you might be right, but practically, I think it's, it's not a good decision. What, but back to Peter's uh, question. So he's confronting now a smooth retina, 
an irregular break right in the macula, and he's selecting a surface amniotic membrane patch. So, Grazia, pretend you had never seen him describing that he's going to put amniotic membrane on the retina. What would your approach have been? Now, indeed, you need something to cover it, as you don't want to use laser, of course, due to the position of that break. An alternative to amniotic membrane is to take a piece of retina from the far periphery. Uh, there is, a, um, let me say, a laser, quite strong laser treatment at the mid-periphery, at the equator, but the anterior part, the retina is still there. So you can take a piece of retina and use it uh, uh, like this. Instead of putting on top, uh, retina is softer, it's more elastic, and you can fit it better under the brake. And so this is my alternative, but I, I think definitely you need something to, to step further. So a patch and uh, uh, Klaus. Yes, exactly. May, may I answer to I Grazia? The question is may if... May I if, answer if, to Grazia? Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Um, because this is, of course, a, 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 a genius idea. Um, but we have uh, two years ago in the last uh, Floretina life surgery, we have shown exactly this uh, neuroretinal um, um, retina patch from the periphery for persistent macular hole. And this was part of the, a series of uh, these 80 persistent macular holes within two cases were done with neuroretinal, uh, with retina. And in both cases, the, the break didn't uh, close, and the neuroretina was only atrophic. It disappeared within three months. It, there was no bridging of glial tissue, not at all. It was just a necrotic piece of tissue that disappeared after three months. So I, I, I'm a little bit disappointed, although I think this is uh, easier to handle a retina patch than an amniotic patch. Yeah, Grazia is right. Yeah. Yeah, um, indeed, the, they asked me the alternative. I think the amniotic membrane is a good alternative, but if you don't have it in your OR, then I think retina is still a good, uh, a good possibility. Uh, I think in this uh, mm, setting that it is important to maintain the right um, orientation of the retina because if you put the retina, uh, the, the photoreceptors on the choroid, they will survive. Uh, the retina remains uh, uh, elastic. If you put the other side, and then the internal retina will be dead because you cast the vascularization, the retina vascularization, and the photoreceptors cannot uh, survive, the photoreceptors Seems layer, good. the outer layers cannot survive because they mm -hmm. are upside down and they are not in contact with the choroid, then you end up indeed with uh, uh, some scar tissue. So it's very important to, to keep the right so, so, Peter, I agree with everything that's being said. We're, you know, a uh, very sophisticated discussion. But what about, since you have peeled ILM, what about a chance of just doing face-down positioning with tamponade with no patch? I mean, yes, it might fail, but if it closes, like now, like a normal macular hole, you win big. Uh, you don't have any material there. What do you think of that? Is it completely crazy? And you can say yes, because both Grazia and Klaus think I'm completely crazy. No, uh, no. But what about a try of tamponade with prolonged face-down positioning for this break, now that you've relieved the ILM? Yeah, it's, it's not crazy at all. Yeah? Basically, everything is possible. It depends on two factors. Yeah? So every macular hole can only close uh, if you have two um, situations, one is relieving the tangential traction, and the second is uh, to bridge the defect by glial tissue. And you must try both. And in persistent macular holes, where ILM peeling is already done, you have no chance to, to 
to um, remove additional tangential traction. And in this case, yes, because there hasn't been done an ILM peeling before. So I've seen that the ILM is still in place. And I rarely see retinal detachment um, from external clinics um, where during retinal detachment surgery routinely ILM peeling is performed. Uh, we do it sometimes in high-risk PVR cases, but in most cases we don't do it in the primary surgery. And the second is the glial Thank bridging. You, uh, Peter, Peter, we and you, Peter, we have to leave. Uh, I want to cut to uh, Francesco Bosch. Uh, so, Francesco, we're back with you in OR3. So tell us where you are in your case. What I found, yes, what I found uh, was that there is still an attached hyaluronic. I don't know whether you can see this. The hyaluronic which I yes. attached with the forceps uh, from the periphery. Okay, so at, uh, here the hyaluronic escaped uh, before the matter or matter thickness. Uh, so this is a good news because at least uh, we spared one uh, surgical time. Uh, I don't think I'm going to feel the diarrhea because there is no obvious traction. Uh, the matter looks uh, fine and flat. So I will continue dissecting the periphery, the diarrhea from the periphery, uh, looking for the uh, uh, retina break, at least the recurrent uh, retina break is totally not with the recurrent detection. Well, th thank you, so, but we need to leave and go to OR2. Luigi, uh, can you describe where you are in your case, Dr. Coretti? Uh, now, as you can see, we completed the ILM peeling in this area. And uh, uh, I checked uh, and, uh, for uh, any other um, PBR in the, the creation of other breaks. And so uh, at the end, uh, and that having the, the break yes. be slightly, that would be my opinion, but I certainly cannot claim no, no, I, the I, I, I don't agree with I, that. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I would leave it. You can laser it. Uh, you can do everything. The retina is very thin. I don't think the traction. So why, why, but, why making a new edge it, and a new wound? Yes, mm. oh, it's also my opinion. And uh, I did uh, two marks because now I'm... Uh... Personally, in uh, such a PVR case, I would do laser all around 360. Um, and, and also uh, concerning the connection of the uh, retinotomy or not retinotomy, I think indeed in this case it's not so important because it is very, very anterior. It's very close to the ora serrata. Right. Right. So the, the traction that can be caused by these bridges is very, very limited. I would be much more concerned if it was in the mid periphery. In room one. Chase A. Chase A, we're with you. Uh, uh, hello, Cesare. And we, can you switch to room one, please? We will, uh, yes, Cesare, we're with you, and we will look at the slide for, no, we're not, it says Camporossi, but it's Mario P. Okay, if we can have the slide for Cesare's case, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. So, Cesare, we're with you. Yes. We've, we've seen the uh, frightening OCT of your patient. I think the problem is that the retina is very thin. That is a, the problem. And uh, the membrane, you see that is very strong. And then uh, I tried to open the, the nasal side. Uh, I tried to... Chaser, we will come right back, but I want to catch... No, Peter Sherman in room four. If you can give us that final view of the retina one more time, yeah. if we can go to room four uh, to look at the patch in yeah. place. Peter, yes. may we see? Thank you. Ah. This is a perfect point. You haven't missed anything because I've shown the spreading and silicon oil filling 
in the surgery before, but I want to discuss and show two small minor tricks which I have learned with about 30 cases of amniotic membrane, epiretinal amniotic membrane. The first is to assure the right uh, orientation. We use the shark fin mark, which we have published for uh, DMEX surgery where the same technique is applied. So this is a very small triangular mark which is done with a scissor and this shows you if the position is regular or upside down. It's very small. I'm not sure if you can see it now, but um, it's a triangular mark here. And Peter, it looks which like side? a shark fin. Peter, be specific, Peter. Which side do you want down? Because some people may not know. Yeah, which the side choroidal, do you want down? I want to have the choroidal the side yeah. down. Yeah. The choroidal sign is the healing side, and the upper side is the amniotic side, and this is uh, the sliding area for g the glial proliferation. Um, so this is the, the one trick, and the second trick is, although the spreading is done under air, at the end, when the position is correct, I fill it up with one milliliter PFCL and wait for five seconds. After that, the patch is sticky to the retina. Otherwise, it looks that it's um, in good orientation, but if you fill in silicon oil, the silicon oil will push the amniotic membrane away. It will dislocate. And after five minutes of PFCL, it's so sticky that it's adhering to the retina. This has improved my surgical success. Well, terrific tips, and thank you very much for sharing your excellent surgery with Floretina. Uh, let, us, uh, let us return to OR3, Francesco Boscia. Because in, in my opinion, when it is so adherent to the retina, sometimes... Uh, the schistos, these small bridges, but it's... Uh, I think it's not very different between 25 and 27 in these cases. What do you think? No, probably not. Probably not. As I, uh, I still use, due to the other instruments, uh, reusable instruments, so we, for routine cases, we use 20... 23, and then there is indeed a significant difference between... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we need a calendar when we speak to Dr. <laughs> Dr. Eckhart. I'm going to get something or some kind of stopwatch. Uh, let's do our interview now with Peter. Uh, we'll come back to you, uh, Francesco, but uh, Peter Sherman in room four, if we could uh, have our, a brief interview. So, Peter, you, you showed us something new yet again. Uh, for an irregular break with uh, a, a beautiful amniotic patch with two tricks to keep it in place. Uh, other thoughts about this, uh, this, this case? Uh, yes, I hope we still have satellite time. I think it's, uh, it's finishing. You do. Um, so basically I wanted to show on the one hand uh, the first surgery the strategies, ILM flaps, different techniques, or the subretinal blep technique, but in persistent macular holes, we don't have the same situation. It's not just the resurgery, because we have nothing to peel and nothing to relieve the traction, and there we need to apply um, new techniques, like Grazia has said, the retina patch, or the amniotic patch, or maybe the subretinal patch, I have no experience with that, the Rizzo technique. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think it's not very difficult, and I cannot conclusively judge if this technique has an additional benefit. But from the theoretical point of view, it adds the glial bridging, and that's what is needed in persistent macular holes. Terrific. We, we, want, we want to see an OCT in uh, three weeks. <laughs> yes, with pleasure. So, do we, <laughs> Send me, please. Do we, have, do we have questions for the audience? For, uh, he's, he's gone. Okay. 